If that is what she finds, she vows to have a bonfire right here in the inner halls of the academy, its appetite whetted by purple robes and to be sated by the institution itself. All right, we goblins right here <laughs> inside the chamber. What is, uh, oh, I think she told Pavel to stand his ground. All right, crew, let's take them down. Body's just gonna stand there, I think. All right, Ray of Frost. Here he comes. All right, crew, let's take them down. Not sure what he's doing. All right. Almost as blind as the badger. Blind or deaf? Lily's not sure. Bim or Pavel? She still can't tell them apart. He's probably both, she imagines. It's another chamber whose purpose Lily can't quite discern. In the middle is a curious divining pool. The smooth marble surface. So smooth it's hard to determine where the stone ends and the water begins. Otherwise, off to the side is a small storage room. Now just wait right I can do there, that. and don't move a muscle until I say. <laughs> Skeleton keys, long metal picks, and other assorted thieves tools. She guesses this might be the offices of security, espionage, and intrigue, as Keta so officially put it. Couldn't possibly be that cretin Sir Dyer. Apes like him only resort to common violence, not intelligent countermeasures. You just follow me and stay close. I can do that! Lily thinks about the wind by the fireside poem she read earlier in the faculty library. In particular, the lines, The north cannot swallow you. The snows cannot bury you. Some believe it relates to the crater races of Fey Run, which Lily has to admit she has little knowledge of, which is why she held on to the origin of magic, a tome which talks about them. All right. Looks like some weak skeletons in here. Man. Let's see what you've got! Oh boy. Yeah, I think Bones is contemplating, I think, running down the hallway. Yeah, his spot is so good. <laughs> Alright. Needs to help a little bit. Pavel's like blind. As Lily explores what she assumes to be Ellenwood's office chambers, she reflects on what she's discovered in that tome, the origin of magic. The creator races are called such since they created through experimentation with magic, more raw and potent back then than it is today. The races of elves, dragons, goblins, and other countless creatures of the new age. But then, after a rapid climate change that made the world unsuitable to them, they quickly met their own end. The only surviving descendants of the race, surprisingly enough, are lizard folk, bullywogs, and aracocra, a type of humanoid bird. Many sages believe that 
they in fact unwittingly cause this cataclysmic climate change themselves. And as proof of the theory, they refer to the Star Mounds, an impressive and forbidding mountain range located in the high forest here in the north, whose origins are most likely magical and otherworldly. The mountains are not only difficult to traverse, but no known passes exist to the interior. And with the incredibly high winds and hazardous weather, practically no one can safely approach the interior by air either. So again, you are not forsaken. You are not forgotten. The north cannot swallow you. The snows cannot bury you. I will come for you. Phaeron will grow warmer, and the gods will smile. But oh my love, guard yourself well. All this may not happen for a long, long while. Lily wonders if the poem and the theory are somehow related. That is, if there's something buried deep underneath the star mounds. Apparently, Bones fell asleep in Elwood's private ritual room. That, or he had a sudden urge for piety towards a certain aging one-handed warrior with a bloody bandage covering his wounded eyes, who happens to advocate to always reveal the truth, punish the guilty, right the wrong, be true and just in your actions, uphold the law wherever you go, punish those who do wrong under the same law, and to deliver vengeance to the guilty for those who cannot do it themselves. His mistress didn't think so. All right, sure enough, four goblins. Lily certainly has no idea where she is now, as it looks like the same storage area with goods and supplies she found when first entering the inner halls. Which reminds her, she needs to resupply herself. Or rather, since she can't quite afford to buy anything at the moment, to at least peruse what's available from the merchants of Neverwinter. And because of the plague, her favorite color should be in fashion, too. Bones for bones. I will crush you beneath my boot. Oh, okay. It's another mysterious mage. Alright, I think Bones will charge. Fighting, look, yeah, a weak skeleton. Here's the mage uninjured. All right. Forgot to set this up in the uh, quick bar magic missile. Healing kit for bones. Lily just took a hit. All right, crew. Let's take them down. 
Wow, I actually think that was close. Thought uh, the mage was gonna target bones, not Lily there. Yeah, if we hadn't leveled up, probably would have been it. <laughs> A wand of sleep. Not the most powerful wand, of course, but Lily's thankful for it nonetheless. And fully charged, too. This was Lily's first brush with mortality since, well, become immortal again. She'd almost forgotten how it felt. The fear. The adrenaline. How desperate it all seems. A quick pat for her faithful familiar, and a swift swig of a healing potion. And she's ready to just about give up fighting Jeru's laboratory. Unless... That's it. He must have been a complete fraud. He probably never crafted a single rod in his life. Instead, he probably bought them on the cheap, or rather had them stolen. Maybe through some arrangement with one of Keta's students like Bruno. Then, all he'd have to do is sloppily scratch out the traitor's mark and etch in his own on the handle. What did he used to say? For being a cut above the rest. It was that weasel's private little joke. Lily examines the mark, and it does look awfully sloppy. Not one made by a skilled artificer. Makes her feel better, convinced it wasn't crafted by Jeru after all. Wow, okay. Goblin waiting right here at the door. Fighting a weak skeleton through the door <laughs> that Pavel can't see. What's he doing? Man, all right. Finally, an alchemical laboratory. Though, it couldn't possibly be Jeru's, as he's been exposed as a fraud. But, it probably is. Simply because of what an utter disappointment it is. Not a single staff, rod, or even scrap of parchment to be found anywhere. Just a few measly potions, a gem, and a handful of books. Exactly the pathetic type of laboratory Lily would expect Jeru to keep. Lily examines the mark again, and now it looks a bit neater. One made by tiny hands with perhaps a speck of talent. Makes her feel confused, unsure what to think anymore and she decides to forget the issue altogether. Famous citizens of the Sword Coast. Needless to say, Lily's disappointed to not see her name listed and discredits it as unworthy of a careful read on that basis alone. But, while skimming the pages, she does come across a familiar name in the following passage. The most powerful and feared spellcasters on the Sword Coast are members of the Arcane Brotherhood of Luskin. Among their number are Jaluth Alareth, Ornar of the Claw, and Deltagar Zelhund. Little is known of the Brotherhood's actual role in governing Luskin and the surrounding areas, and the members themselves are loath to discuss their activities. That's Jaluth Snakeface Alareth, to whom Lily wrote a letter from the Thane Embassy in Waterdeep on her birthday last year. Who, Lily is reminded to her annoyance, never wrote her back. She smiles, wondering again if hissing fang serpents erupted from Jalu's face when she got to the part about Snake Face. Now, Lily is finally ready to wrangle beasts for Lady Arabeth de Tumarand. She almost forgot that that's what the key was for. 